Good morning, everybody. Michael the Maven. Thank you for coming. If this is your first time to my channel, today we're going to be talking about the 1DX Mark III announcement that was made last night. I've had a little bit of time to digest it. Anytime a new camera comes out, there's 2.5 questions that we as viewers should be asking ourselves. Number one, what can this camera do that no other camera can do? And in parentheses after that, I put for me. And the second question is, at what cost? At the time of this recording, it's gonna be $6,500, supposed to ship mid-February, so it's coming up very soon. It's obviously a very large camera, very heavy camera, so right off the bat, we know a couple of the drawbacks. The reason why this announcement is so important, I believe, is because it highlights a very specific campaign coming from Canon in the year 2020. I've already made a video talking about why Canon will dominate in 2020. And so this is the first camera that we're, we're seeing released. We knew it was coming, but there are some very interesting things about the 1DX Mark III that make it a superior camera to everything else out there. And so after I read through the specs, there are a few points and conclusions that I came to. Some of this is great, some of it is not as important, but I can tell you right now, Canon is aware of what it needs to do in terms of competitive advantages. When I say competitive advantage, it means that a company or a business can do something that is not very easy to replicate. And when we look at what the 1DX Mark III is designed for, sports shooting, the 1DX Mark III is going to be king for at least a certain amount of time, maybe, maybe even years. I think Sony's done a pretty good job with the A9 and the A9 II. Nikon is right at its heels with the D5. But let's talk about the 1DX Mark III. In terms of my highlights, the number one most important thing that this camera can do over all their cameras is its mechanical frames per second. We're looking at 16 through the viewfinder, 20 in live view that maintains autofocus. That is astonishingly spectacular for a high-end sports shooter. I can't think of any other camera that really gets into that range of 20 frames per second mechanical. Why is that important? Well, I know many of you are gonna say, well, the A9 will shoot 20 frames per second, but that is an electronic mode. And when we shoot in electronic modes in stadiums with LED lights, there's the chance that we're gonna get that banding artifact that we've seen time and again. High-end sports shooters can't go to a sporting event hoping that they're not using LED lights. And so I, I believe this is, one of the reasons why in the A9 II, it went from five mechanical frames per second to 10 mechanical frames per second. Sony's aware of this. I really like what Sony's doing with the A9 in its technology, but it has some real weaknesses that I'll, I'll highlight near the end. A high-end professional sports shooter is gonna want that 16 mechanical or 20 mechanical. That is the cream of the crop right now. Nobody else is doing this better than Canon. When we looked at the 1DX Mark II, the buffer was astonishingly good. I shot 900 raw frames consecutively without any slowdown and it cleared the buffer in five seconds. Now what we're seeing in the 1DX Mark III is over a thousand frames. So the takeaway in terms of the buffer depth in the clear speed is that it's doing something the 1DX Mark II did very well, it's just doing it better. Third competitive advantage, the high efficiency image format, that's not something we've seen in other cameras. It basically allows us to shoot at a higher bit depth, 10 bits versus eight in JPEG at half the file size. So in terms of efficiency, that is spectacular. I know we've seen this in smartphones and things of that nature, but this is the first major camera that I'm personally aware of that is going with that file format and therefore, Right now, it's a competitive advantage. The new touch sensitive autofocus on, it's like a little button slash movie pad kind of thing, far superior to the touch pad that we saw in the EOS R. From what I've seen of it, it looks spectacular in terms of the ergonomics, the ease of use. It's gonna speed up the changing of the focusing squares. In my personal opinion, Canon should put that for every AF on button on every camera they have, it's a competitive advantage. They should exploit it. I know there's a lot of excitement about the video and this is something I'm not quite as excited about even though it's 5.5K in RAW, which is crazy. The problem with it is, is when you go in and you look at the auto focusing modes at 60 frames per second, it's manual focus. And so there's only, only DCI 4K, if I remember correctly, was the only one that had auto focus at 60 frames per second. When we look at the data rate for that 5.5K raw, 
you're looking at basically 19 gigabytes per minute, which means if you wanna shoot three minutes of video, you're gonna need a 64 CF Express card. So the, you know, the answer would be, well, not, let's just get one terabyte cards, right? Well, those are $900 each. And so if you're doing a lot of high-end video shooting, you're gonna need at least four of those cards, $4,000 in memory cards. So between the data rate and the loss of focus at 60 frames per second on the high end, you know, in terms of the, the raw video at 5.5K, I'm not quite as excited. I'm probably more interested in the 10-bit the 422 you know, a C log at 30 or 24 frames per second. But when we get into those settings, now we're, we're kind of seeing things that can be done with other Canon video cameras. And so if you're a video shooter, yeah, it's, it's really awesome, it's sexy, it's beautiful. Somebody who shoots a lot of video, it doesn't make as much sense as like a C200 or a C300 Mark II or something like that where you have ND filters and it's designed for video shooting. Don't get me wrong, I love it but I see the video specs more as a flex where Canon is saying, look at what we can do. I'll be far more interested in how this trickles down into other lower end cameras like the 5D Mark V or the, the new R camera that's coming out. Canon usually opens with the new tech on the flagships or the higher end cameras first, and then we see it come out in later cameras. There's a couple things we won't really know until we get into the testing, but when you look at the sensor at 20.1 megapixels, I know a lot of people were upset about that because it doesn't sound like a lot of resolution. I believe this was a strategic move, a correct one made by Canon, because when I look at the Canon 90D, which is an APS-C camera at 32.5 megapixels, it is clear to me there has been a shift in sensor technology. We see the same sensor in the M6 Mark II. The dynamic range over the 80D and the 70D was spectacular, even at a higher megapixel density. So when we take that tech and apply it to a full frame sensor with fewer megapixels, what that implies, the probability of this is pretty great, is that is going to be a very high performing sensor in terms of dynamic range. Now, obviously I won't know until I test it, but in my mind, there's no way that the 90D is outperforming the 1DX Mark III for dynamic range. And taking into account that it's a full frame sensor, fewer megapixels, it's gonna be really, really good. Obviously the word about the low pass filter, it performs as if there was no low pass filter. We really won't know about that until we test it. Sometimes Canon likes to embellish some of their specs and say, hey, this can do something. Sort of like what we saw with the dual pixel RAW. The tech was there, but in, act, in terms of actual performance, it wasn't that great. I expect the low-pass filter to be really good because I've seen a lot of images and they look outstanding. Something that's interesting in the specs that you read is they, they have two, two processors. There's a Digic 8 processor and there's a Digic 10 processor. The Digic 8 processor, to me, interestingly, is dedicated to focusing and metering while the Digic 10 processing is dedicated to image processing. That is very important because when you're shooting multiple frames per second, you require the need for continuous focus as those images are being written. And so there's some other cameras that have used this strategy in the past, but I thought it was interesting that it broke it up into two different types of processors. I won't really know until I get my hands on the camera probably in February or March and do some of my own tests, but Hopefully, I'll, I'll do another epic shootout and we'll really know where it stands. What does all of this mean for the casual shooter or somebody who's very serious about sports shooting? When we compare it with the A9, I really liked what Sony did with their sensor where they're doing a full sensor readout to get that 20 frames per second, but it's electronic. So Sony has to figure out a way to get more mechanical frames per second in order to compete with something like the 1DX Mark II. Sony also still has the problem of lenses. The ecosystem is getting stronger, but it, there is in no way, shape, or form is it coming close to the number of telephoto primes that we're seeing from Canon. The third problem that Sony has is its buffer. Not only is it not as deep, but it takes over a minute to clear. I was very disappointed in that. And I bought an A9. I was using it as my number one sport shooting camera and I eventually sold it because I was frustrated with the buffer. Sony will have to address that. And until they do, in my opinion, Canon is the king. Okay, for sport shooters, take a look at any NFL game you watch. 
the vast majority of those highly professional photographers are using the 1DX Mark II at the time of this recording. What's going to happen is they're gonna upgrade that price is nothing for them. They, they, without even thinking, they'll buy two or three of them. So what's going to happen is the 1DX Mark II, which is always going to be a beast of a camera, is going to become more available for those that are serious about sports shooting. We'll probably start to see them used on eBay in the sub $4,000 range. That is a smoking good deal for that kind of a camera. When I come back and look at my questions, there's no doubt that the 1DX Mark III is doing things that no other camera can do. Canon has a competitive advantage when it comes to flagship sports shooting cameras now on the 1DX Mark III. It's gonna be up to Sony and Nikon to try to catch up. I guess we'll have to wait and see for the D6 announcement. In any event, I would love to know what you guys think about the 1DX Mark III, its strengths and weaknesses. If you're struggling to learn your camera, check out one of my many camera crash courses. I'll put those links in the description. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.